Uh, the subject of this session is going to be the recent research involving uh, the proposal that there was an extraterrestrial impact that took place on planet Earth, uh, specifically somewhere in North America in, I guess, uh, northeastern part of North America. And the timing of the proposed impact coincides uh, at about 12,900 years ago. So it would come just at the uh, end of the last ice age. And stratigraphically, the proposal is that this uh, impact is associated with something that archaeologists have known for a long time as the black mat. Uh, it's a, a very, very widespread uh, geological marker bed that extends uh, from Catalina Island into Maine. And the claim is made now that extends as far east as Germany. And so we have this session today as a follow-on to a presentation that was given last night on the campus of NAU, and we've assembled a panel today to uh, discuss and debate the, some of the technical aspects of that from the astronomy and uh, geolo geology and geochemistry side of things. And we have a very distinguished panel of uh, presenters today, um, and I'll, I'll start from left to right. Uh, at the end of the table here is uh, Mark Boslow from Sandia Laboratories. Uh, he is an expert in uh, computer simulation of uh, air bursts and extraterrestrial impacts of that sort. He has an article in National Geographic this month's issue of National Geographic on uh, his work. Uh, we have uh, seated to his right Carolyn Shoemaker, um, astrogeologist extraordinaire and uh, associated, I'm sure, as you all know, with uh, the Shoemaker-Levy Comet uh, from a few years ago. We're very honored to have her here today. Uh, on my left is John McCone, who is from the Arizona State University Planetary Geology Group. Uh, on my right is Alan West, uh, one of the researchers who was involved in the original proposal of the comet impact. And uh, at the end of the table is Ted Bunch. Both are from NAU and both are uh, co-authors of the um, uh, PNAS article that uh, presented this research, uh, I believe it was in October of last year, September, October of last year. One of the things I wanted to do uh, before we got started was to provide a little bit of context for this research from an archaeological point of view. And I wanted to uh, start by talking about where we have come since 1927. The, the, the general theme of this year's meeting here in Flagstaff, I, I guess if we had to put it in terms that would have been recognizable in the very first PECOS conference would be that we're we're discussing now in some considerable more detail what was known then as Basket Maker 1. And in 1927, Basket Maker 1 was a very nebulous, mysterious, uh, not very well understood period of time of unknown duration that represented that time before people grew corn and made pots and lived in Pueblos and left the very visible archaeological remains that we all know very well. One of the things that is um, very striking about what's happened since 1927, and every now and then I just have to sort of remind myself of what it is that human beings are capable of doing in their curiosity and studies of the world, we now have an extraordinary understanding of Basket Maker 1, to put it in those terms. We've come a long way, baby, since 1927. And the uh, kind of the, the culmination of that understanding, at least at the very earliest end of things, is a paper that was published just this May by C. Vance Haynes of the University of Arizona, who I'm sure you all know is the preeminent researcher on the Clovis culture and the time period that we're talking about. In fact, I think no one on this earth has seen more black mat uh, samples and more, more alluvial stratigraphy from that period of time than Vance Haynes. He couldn't be here today. Uh, I invited him to be on the panel, and he gave me the best excuse that anyone can ever have, that he's, he's going to, to be home writing the results of his life's work. And I, I uh, Vance just celebrated his 80th birthday this year, and I, I'm not going to be the person who interferes with Vance Haynes writing up his life's work. So uh, we're, we're happy that he's not here, in a way, that he's, that he's home writing. Um, what, what I want to do is call your attention to the fact that since 1927, we've learned a lot of things that, as one person has put it, all of us who work in the historical sciences, and that, that being uh, archaeology, um, paleontology, astronomy, the, those historical sciences routinely discover things that we have no right to expect to know. 
These are things that are extraordinary that we, that we even know about these things. And what I want this to, to point out, and I'll quote briefly from Vance's article from May, is that I think we're, we're on the threshold of achieving a very important consensus and, and set of empirical generalizations about what happened at the end of the last ice age. This article that, that Vance published in the PNAS really lays out the extraordinary nature of the black map and what it is that distinguishes it in archaeology. It has a clarity and a, a, a certainty that is almost unknown in archaeology. And, and I, would like to, um, I would like to start by quoting from that article, the very last paragraph, in which this in a way sets the table for what we're going to talk about today. And wh whether or not there was an extraterrestrial impact of the nature that's been proposed, whether or not there was an extraterrestrial impact at all in some people's view, uh, what is the scientific evidence for that? How do we debate that scientifically? How do we know uh, the, the, the truth or the, the, the non-truth of some of the proposals that are being made? That's the fun part of science, and that's what I hope to get a little closer to today in this discussion. But I'd like to start by quoting from Vance Haynes' article, the very last paragraph of that article that, that really makes a summary that, that uh, is as plain as it can be. And the very last sentence of uh, this, this article summary is, I reiterate, something major happened at 12,900 years ago that we have yet to understand. And what he's talking about, when Vance Haynes says something major, um, Vance Haynes is not a man given to extreme statements. And there's, there's not going to be a statement in print in a journal of this um, nature unless he believes that to be the case without a doubt. And so I want to back up a little bit then and talk about what it is that he's talking about. What is the extraordinary event that Vance Haynes refers to in this article? The black mat is a widespread stratigraphic marker that is notable for its abruptness. There is uh, a set of empirical generalizations, summaries of, of what the facts are on the ground, that are pretty extraordinary. The fact is, most of the Pleistocene megafauna, in fact all of the Pleistocene megafauna except the bison, did not make it through to the times after the black mat. And the end of the Pleistocene megafauna is with the black mat. At the time just prior to the deposition of that layer across the continent, and it, it by the way, is not always black. It ranges in color from truly black to actually uh, very light gray or white in color. It seems to vary from place to place in terms of what it is, what formed it. Uh, in some places, it's an algal mat. In other places, it's a sediment deposit of a different kind. Um, so it's not, it's not always black and it's not always formed under the same conditions, but it is always associated with the date, radiocarbon um, calibrated date of about 12,900 years ago. There is no pre-Clovis uh, or no, no projectile point style that we know predates Clovis ever found under the black mat. There are no megafauna besides bison found above the black mat. And there are no Clovis remains ever found in the black map. Those are the three summary statements that are made. This article, by the way, I believe represent, would represent the life's work of Vance Haynes in terms of, of what he's done. He, he in this paper, discusses um, 97 sites, Pleistocene, terminal Pleistocene sites. He finds that of those uh, 97 sites, 70 of them have faunal remains. Of those 70 sites, 70% 70 of them uh, that have faunal remains are in direct contact with the black mat. And in some cases, the black mat is found draped over the bones of the animals. And one of the most notable cases of this is Murray Springs, where if, if you're familiar with what uh, was done at Murray Springs, they discovered a mammoth that had been killed at that place and, and partially butchered. The mammoth was uh, nicknamed Eloise the Elephant. And so when you hear Eloise, then we're talking about that particular specimen. Um, the black mat was draped over the bones and actually stained that elephant. The um, site of Murray Springs had elephant footprints in the mud that presumably were from that very elephant. I believe, the, as Alan tells me, the footprints led to the mammoth carcass. <laughs> pretty, pretty good evidence of that being the case. Um, those footprints were preserved, and the way they were preserved apparently was sometime at 
the time the elephant